everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the talks so far. This is a really great, I found it to be super interesting, but I'm a little biased. Um, so I hope you're all enjoying this. Um, so unfortunately, due to the, uh, due to the uh, extreme weather, we had a speaker not be able to attend. Um, and so I thought I would take a few minutes in this spot to talk a little bit about sort of, a lot of you know what Prism Group does, but sort of what does Prism Group do? And over the past year, as we've been engaged with the economics of dozens of blockchain projects, sort of what do we see as making progress in terms of understanding how the economics of the system, these systems work in practice? And where do we really continue to see issues that um, can be resolved and worked on at a very practical level? All right, so we're Prism Group, um, and we're, we are a blockchain economics and governance advisory. So we're PhD economists who decided that what we wanted to do was um, work at a detailed level with projects to help them design systems that work effectively in terms of their economics as well as technologically. And we do research and advisory and um, education and all sorts of other stuff. And so, you know, bringing together economics and blockchain has, as you know, been, um, it's been an ongoing sort of practice. And you know, one of the things that's been particularly interesting that for those of you who saw Professor Tadella speak at 9.15 is thinking about, you know, how is the economics research that's done in other areas and in other industries, especially other tech areas, applicable to blockchain, right? Can we assume similar uh, characteristics of users? Can we assume similar environments? And what can, can we take the lessons and the processes that have been used so successfully at Amazon and eBay and the Fed and all these other places and bring them into blockchain-based projects? And it's also been an interesting learning environment um, in terms of getting to really work with entire ecosystems. So a lot of economists, when they go off into the world and get a job, they're thinking and focused on this particular market. They might do housing, they might do mon monetary policy, um, and we're lucky in that we get to think about um, entire economies with their own currencies on a regular basis. So one thing we like to say, blockchain projects are economies designed in code. Right, you're really trying to think about how do we set up an economic system, perhaps with its own currency, with varying levels of human interaction and trust, but a lot of them are really their own ecosystems and how do we get the different pieces to work together so that uh, the system works effectively. Um, and as many of you know, you know, one of the big differences when you're thinking about a blockchain-based project as, um, as an economist as compared to a computer scientist is we tend to think of things from the point of view of individual choice, right? So if you sit down with us and you talk about this, one of the first things we'll ask you is, okay, who are the different stakeholders in your projects and what are they going to do? And so we want to understand what is the economic environment for each of the different stakeholders? You know, what are they going to get paid? What do they have to do? What are their options when they're making decisions? And then what does this imply about how the system needs to be designed? Um, and economic design, as you've heard about, is something that gets used all of the time. So Professor Tadellis, of course, was talking about eBay. Um, one of my favorite hidden pieces of dis economic design is the eBay Dispute Resolution Center. Um, so I don't know how many of you, how many folks in here have ever transacted on eBay? Okay, so that's pretty much everybody. You, people don't tend to think of the, the Dispute Resolution Center as a piece of economics, but it is. Um, and it builds on this idea of, of trust. And what happens with the Dispute Resolution Center is you're engaging in a transaction, something goes wrong, um, you're a buyer, you didn't get your stuff, you're a seller, somebody didn't pay you. You can go here and the, there is a combination of uh, code and humans that will help you resolve your problem. So there's sort of some standard problems that you can choose from. And if your problem isn't listed there, you get very quickly escalated to a person. And so what this says is that, you know, if the reputation matching that we heard about this morning doesn't work and you engage with somebody and they try to steal your money and not send you things, the platform will help you to resolve this. And this provides an additional layer that says, you know, you can, you can engage with us, you can take a risk and, um, you know, conduct commerce on this platform. Um, another example of economic design that we see all the time is the Netflix recommendation engine. So the way that the recommendation engine works, um, it was actually introduced by Netflix as an interesting story um, because users were overwhelmed by the Netflix catalog, right? So Netflix gets introduced, 
There's an abundance of movies like no one has ever seen, and it turns out that unless you're a cinephile, you have no idea what to search for. Um, and they realized that if people couldn't find a movie that they wanted to watch within 60 or 90 seconds, they would just stop using the service. And so the investment in the recommendation engine um, was used using a choice model, so understanding who are the different types of users and what kinds of choices do they make, and using that information to basically declutter the market for deciding you know, what is the type of movie that I want to watch. So thinking about, again, all of these different types of, of um, economic environments that we deal with on a regular basis and how can we use some of this insight in blockchain. So as I mentioned this morning, last year I was a presenter on the CESC stage. Um, to my knowledge, I was the only economist. Um, and at the time when I prepared that talk, there was really, um, you know, the, the attitude towards economics was what I call, you know, the blockchain rebel. So basically there was this attitude that we were going to, you know, get rid of central banks. We were going to get rid of, of regulation and centralization. And I was going to stand out in the middle of the desert and start my platform and no one was going to bother me and there weren't going to be any rules. And fortunately we've sort of moved away from that. And I think as projects launch and develop and, you know, there are various issues, we see the need for central design, for trust, for, for platform intermediation. So this has um, become less of an issue, I think, over the past year. There's an acceptance that economic design is going to come along with uh, technological design in order for projects to work. Um, and at PRISM Group, we have, um, after a lot of thinking and talking with projects, um, we've developed what we call our PRISM Group House. And we, we were thinking about, you know, how do we both for ourselves and for projects, communicate the different layers of economics that can go into a blockchain project. Um, and so this is what the house is. Um, I used to be a consultant, so framework. Um, but you know, starting with first, what is the value proposition working from the bottom? What is it that the platform's trying to do? Who's gonna use this? Um, capital investment and financing has become less of a thing over the past year. We don't talk to as many projects raising via ICOs, but there are still some. Um, and then we get into the layers of economic design. So thinking about starting on the left-hand side, um, the contract design, right? So when you have a buyer and a seller working together, what are they agreeing to do? What are the terms, right? How do we know that this has succeeded? How do we know payment has taken place? What happens if there's a dispute or the need for somebody to intervene to make the transaction successful? Then thinking about market design. So market design are things like you know, that we heard about paternalistic search first thing this morning. How do buyers and sellers find each other, right? How do we match people in this marketplace so that people are able to generate, you know, value generating transactions? Apologies, I think I just lost it. Um, what kind of information is the platform going to provide? Um, and again, um, building on this, rep the reputation talk that we heard this morning, um, the platform is thinking a lot about maybe the, you know, the feedback about users is user generated. Maybe all the reviews on eBay are submitted by other users, but the platform has to think about how is this going to be summarized, right? What is the metric we're going to use? How are we going to display it? Where are we going to display it? Um, what incentives does this create for the different users on the platform? And then finally, on top of that, thinking about once you have your economic environment, what role is the token going to play if there is one? And then the governance is how do you think about making changes and decisions over time. Um, and so over the past, I would say six to eight months, um, we've used this a lot to you know, provide economic structure and really think about you know, how do we build the layer after layer of, a, of the economics of a blockchain platform so that everything works harmoniously. And so what I want to talk about for the remainder of the talk is sort of three pivots that I've seen in projects' attitudes towards economics. And I think this is sort of comparing from last year to, to this year. Um, and I'm not going to have extremely specific sort of research questions, but I'm going to talk about you know, what are three areas that we see projects really thinking about um, and trying to figure out how to solve now going forward. And then hopefully a year from now, we'll talk about how they've been fixed. Um, so the first challenge with designing any decentralized environment is thinking about how you design incentives. Right, so if you're thinking about um, incentives, and we think a lot about pay for performance in blockchain-based platforms, right, 
uh, block rewards or form of pay for performance, you're basically saying, you know, you have a group of stakeholders, you need them to contribute time, energy, resources to your platform, you have to compensate them so that they want to participate, but figuring out what exactly do they need to do and then how are you going to pay them is a, a very tricky economics problem, right? And the world is filled with poorly designed performance incentives. So my favorite example is uh, Wells Fargo, where they, uh, as you all know, they paid employees to open accounts because they thought that number of accounts correlated with revenues. But it turns out when you pay people to open accounts, what they do is open a lot of fake accounts. Um, so per bad performance management systems are extremely costly. Um, and thinking about how to design them well is extremely important for blockchain projects, as you know. Um, so for example, if you think about you know, a classic, which is the incentive design for Bitcoin, you can think about um, the block reward designs of how uh, Bitcoin incentives work as a force shaping the market, sort of how many miners are you gonna have, um, how much consolidation is going to, they're going to be. Um, if you think about what were sort of the, the initial objectives for the market for mining for Bitcoin, you know, they wanted, there was a goal to have a lot of adoption, uh, there was a goal for this to be a peer-to-peer -peer market, for it to be very secure, as we've heard about, you know, this, these have achieve, been achieved. However, um, this goal of distributed control has not been so much. So I've seen different estimates, but one estimate was I've seen is that 85% of mining power is controlled one way or another by Bitmain. I don't know if that's accurate, but there's a, a significant amount of consolidation. Um, and if you write out the economic models, you can show that a lot of the drivers of this consolidation is the design of the performance incentives that were used. And so trying to figure out, you know, how do we decrease consolidation and how do we design performance incentives to do what we want is an important piece of, of any blockchain platform. Um, and so I would say, you know, a year ago when we were thinking about incentive design, there was this idea that tokens are magic, right? And this is one of my favorite examples. I haven't seen too many token curated registries anymore these days, um, but a token curated registry was this de complex decentralized way of, of curating a list. Um, and it, re it required participation from a number of different actors. You needed voters, you needed agents who wanted to be on the list, and they all needed to engage in, in cooperative behavior so that the platform worked. Um, and many TCR projects, when faced with a complex incentive problem, said, okay, we're going to introduce a token, and we're going to give everybody the token, and all of the pieces that we need for the TCR to work are going to work simply because we've introduced a native platform token. Um, and one of the pieces that we've talked about, which I think has become more well understood, is that just giving somebody a token, it doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do what you want them to do, right? You have to think about what activities do you need people to undertake? How are you going to measure whether they've undertaken these activities? Are you, what are you going to pay them in? Is it going to be a token? What is the value of the token? and so forth. So this, this way of thinking of just sort of tokens or magic um, has, I think, gone by the wayside. Um, however, there's still this question of how do you design effective incentives? And what we see is a lot of platforms are, are thinking about some, how do you overcome some very common um, pay for performance problems? So these are four that we see quite frequently. Um, one of them is, is called moral hazard, which is basically that you're not paying people exactly for, for what you need them to be doing, and so they're going to under-provide effort compared to what you would like. Um, there's a problem called free riding, which is basically that if I'm contributing a public good to a, good, a public good and we need many people to contribute, I'm just going to assume that you're going to do it, and I'm, not going, to do, I'm going to slack compared to what you want. Um, there are problems of multitasking, which is that I need you to do three different things, but I only pay you for one of them, and so you only do that one thing. And then, of course, there's gaming. And if any of you have ever had a platform where there's been a money pump, this is gaming, right? People who are not doing what they're supposed to, who are instead taking advantage of, of loopholes in um, any pay, per, pay for performance system. Um, and these, the last one has been a problem. Um, one platform that had some issues with 
Um, money pumps and performance incentives has been storage. They've talked about this publicly, so I, I commend them for thinking about this. Um, but they did find that as they launched the initial um, levers of their platform for decentralized peer-to-peer -peer storage, um, pretty much every sort of money pump and opportunity for gaming was taken advantage of by users on the platform. Um, so getting this right can be incredibly important if you don't want to have to take your system down and reboot it. And so as we think about effective incentive design, you know, there are really three levers that we talk about. And I think one thing that will be very interesting, again, building on the reputation discussion from this morning, is seeing how platforms are gonna layer these different levers in order to create effective incentives, right? So you can think about for incentive design, there's how do I pay you? So there's sort of the transaction terms. What are you gonna give me and what do I give you in return? Um, there's the promise of future business, right? So I want to do well by you so that you come back and use my services in the future. So there's sort of a temporal aspect. Um, and then there's also thinking about things like incorporating um, reputation scores into other parts of the platform. Like if you turns out that you're terrible to people who buy from you, maybe I, you don't show up in search anymore. Right, and so how do we layer all of these different pieces together to incentivize users to do what you want them to do? Um, and so again, I think the, um, the evolution, you know, leaving behind the idea that a native token is magic has been fantastic, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, platforms will, will think about the, the interaction of the different levers in shaping user incentives. Uh, the second transformation that we've seen over the past year is what I call copy-paste to strategic borrowing. Right, so um, there's a problem that I like to call the borrowed suit, um, and this was something that we saw a lot with economic design, I would say, 12 to 18 months ago, which is that um, a platform would need, for example, a governance system and would say, oh, there's a governance system on that other platform that looks like it works, and they would just take the whole thing and paste it. Um, and that has um, become less common, I think, which is good. Um, and one thing you'll see from all of the talks today is that economic design is a bespoke service, right? You really have to think about what is it we're trying to achieve, um, what is my specific environment, who are my users, and what does that mean about customization? Um, and so sometimes now what we see is sort of going in the opposite direction. So you'll see a lot of platforms reinventing the wheel. And so I think that um, what I'm hoping to see more of and that we're starting to see um, is strategic borrowing, right? So saying, okay, well, there's a platform, so we see this a lot, for example, with Tezos. Tezos has well-developed governance. And so, you know, how do we borrow from them but customize it to our platform in a way that suits our particular economic environment? Um, and when we're doing any kind of economic design for a new platform, you know, there's really an iterative process that you'll hear about throughout the day. So you start by saying, you know, what are the models I'm working off of, and then how do I collect evidence, run experiments, and implement this to make sure that what I have designed is going to work in my own specific environment. And this gets used, you know, both on and off of blockchain. Um, and an example that I like to use about sort of the benefits and limits of customization comes from an area of market design that's called matching. Um, and this is building on the Gale Shapley algorithm, if any of you have ever taken operations research. Um, so this is a classic matching algorithm that got used about 20 years ago to design the algorithm that assigns new doctors to their first jobs. This is called a medical residency here in the US. Um, and they took this particular algorithm and then had to do some customization. So one thing, for example, they had to change when they implemented this was that they had to allow married couples because it turns out that medical students all marry each other. And if you tell them to go through an algorithm where they can't partner with their spouse and they get assigned to Seattle and their spouse is in Tennessee, they're not going to be very happy. Um, so this algorithm went through a level of customization. It was extremely successful. And a couple years after this was implemented, a number of public school systems showed up and asked the team that had done the residency match um, if they could please implement a matching algorithm for um, public school districts to assign students to schools. And what's interesting about this is that the underlying mechanism is largely the same, 
However, there's been a lot of customization based on the specific environment. So obviously, you typically don't have to worry about um, you know, fifth graders being married to each other. However, you might have siblings, right? Or it turns out that people really want to go to a school that's close to their house. So maybe you give priority to people who live closer by to a particular school. And so when they were doing this design project, it was really a combination of taking the underlying algorithm, which worked really well, and figuring out what were the necessary tweaks that are required in order to make this work in the new environment. Um, and I think that you know, as, as blockchain design goes forward, um, I'm encouraged by the borrowing that we see, right? I think you know, inventing things out of whole cloth is um, frequently inefficient. But figuring out how do we tweak these systems so that we're not copying and pasting, but we're also not you know, reinventing the Supreme Court. Um, and the final pivot that we've seen teams think about and, and struggle with, and I anticipate seeing a lot of progress on over the next six to 12 months, is the, how much governance do you want? Right, so going back to the, the idea of the blockchain rebel, many early, pro, many early projects didn't have any formal governance at all. Um, and by governance, we mean basically um, decision-making processes that aren't operational rules, right? So a couple examples of governance. Um, when there was the DAO hack, and Ethereum had to figure out, you know, what are we going to do with this $50 million that was stolen from the DAO? Are we going to reverse the transaction or not? The community came together and made a decision. Then there was a fork. But these types of crises situations that are unanticipated need to be addressed. Um, you know, when CryptoKitties overloaded Ethereum and they had to figure out how to increase the chain's capacity and what to do with all these dead transactions, decision-making processes were very important. So I think the, the industry has moved from not needing governance to understanding that governance is important. Um, no, you cannot eliminate the need for governance by changing operational rules. This is because of something called incomplete contracts that many of you have heard us speak about before. Um, but I think the, the issue now is governance overload, right? So you have a lot of platforms that are saying, okay, great, we're going to use a system of representative democracy, and then it turns out that nobody votes. And so we've gone from no governance to, I won't say too much governance, but a lot of involvement. And so how do you come to something in the middle that is both representative uh, but not overwhelming to your user base? Um, and so what we see a lot of platforms um, thinking about is to what extent they want to use representative democracy, right? To what ex when do you need a public referendum versus having a set of delegated decision makers who are going to make the bulk of decisions? Um, and economically, delegation of this kind has a lot of benefits, right? So our economy um, exists on division of labor, right? We don't all do everything, which is good. Um, we typically specialize in a couple of tasks. This applies to government, too. And also, there's a degree of benefits, um, benefits from uh, specialization, right? So especially if you think about somebody who is trying to decide whether protocol upgrades are good for a particular platform, there's a level of expertise that's required there, right? Your typical token holder may not have any idea. Somebody who has expertise in security and how the, the details of the platform work um, may be a far more effective decision maker. And so um, I'm interested to see how um, different delegated models um, both are implemented and the reaction of the community because um, specialization can be very helpful. Um, on the other hand, it also requires trust that we've talked about before. Um, and so anyway, I hope that um, we're always happy to talk about any of these issues. Um, you're going to hear more from one of our founding partners, Reed Cataldo, a little bit later about how we're thinking about investing in research in some of these problems. Um, and hopefully next year we'll have a further round about how we have solved some of these different challenges. Thank you.